So to start my TED talk today, I'm going to start with a picture of an eight-year-old. So you probably can't tell much from the picture, but there's thoughts in this eight-year-old's little brain. Um, he's happy that his mom was able to take off work and leave early to come to the school party today and take this picture. He's waiting for that little girl in the black shirt in the corner. He's waiting for her to stop hogging the markers so he can decorate his piece of paper. He's wondering if he's going to go on the after-school bus when he gets home, or if his mom is going to take him home. He's cautiously eyeing the face painter on the other side of the room, waiting for the face painter to have opportunity to paint his face. So those are a lot of typical thoughts that fill an eight-year-old's brain. He lives in a little bubble. It's, it's a safe bubble, definitely. It's a, a bubble of similar ideas, similar people, similar thoughts, and it's arguably a really good place to grow up as a child. But this little eight-year-old always wondered about things that he couldn't see day to day. He always yearned for more info. It got to the point where he would actually wake up earlier before school just to watch the news. He would crawl into his parents' bed while his mom was getting ready for work to go to the city. And he would wrap himself in blankets and pretend his mom couldn't see him watch the news for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, as much as he could before he got on the bus to go to school. He, he craved this information, you know, the small town that surrounded him shielded him from the bad. But in that bubble, the world's diversity was shielded behind him too. Of course, I know about the thoughts of this eight-year-old, because that eight-year-old was me. Now, my mom was the type of mom, the stereotypical only child parent, who took pictures of everything. She always had this little Canon camera that she would pull out of her purse or pull out of her back pocket. Any instance she could, she would take pictures. So, I, I recently got the opportunity to find a bunch of these old pictures, and you can see such a lack of this diversity I'm talking about in these pictures. You can see these carbon copy, most of these kids, you know, look, look very similar to each other. There are these, um, there are these carbon copy Caucasian family ideal. It's certainly something we've always seen throughout the years. Um, I remember around this age, um, my cousin was away at Towson, and he told me about all of these clubs that he was getting involved with that were for different organizations, you know, like Black Student Union or Muslim Student Union stuff like that that he was, you know, seeing presentations on. And I remember wondering, you know, who were in these clubs? Because I never really had a firm physical grasp. I could never really match the word Muslim or match, the, match those type of words with a group of people because I never really saw them in school. And as I got older, I began to see that not only was I lacking this information, but other kids around me were too because Obviously, I'm not the only one in this town. 1,167 counties in the United States are more than 90% Caucasian. That's a pretty jarring number, but to break it down, it's, I believe, around 55% of countries in the United, or counties in the United States. So 55% of these, of these counties are filled with this similar type of people. Caucasian American, usually the stereotypical American dream, American dream. It means, it's even more interesting here, because while we are over 90% white, including Hispanic, only around 79% of Putnam County is fully white. 93% of Putnam County is white and Hispanic. And roughly 7% of our county contains all of those other groups your African American community, your Native American community, your Asian community, your Middle Eastern community, all of these different groups of people only fill 7% of our county. Statistically in the United States, at least in counties like this, one in four are not white. In our town, 90% is around there. Even more extreme than Putnam County's average of around 80%. Putnam County has about a 90% white non-Hispanic rate. This lack of diversity becomes even more clear if you do what I did with those pictures and take a look back and look at the pictures from your childhood. And the statistics that we have for our town is that one in 10 of Brewster is identifies as non-white. 
that one person out of 10, look at this class, there's not even 10 of us in here. One in 10 fits this rainbow of different cultures, this different lifestyles. So you're probably asking me now, well, you can't, you can't pick your neighbors, so why are you complaining? Why, why are you saying, oh, what's, like, what's the problem with these people and what's the problem with the diversity in our town? Well, I'm not saying that living in a community like this is wrong. I'm not saying that there's any problem with living here. I'm grateful to have grown up here. But I remember being around that age again, eight or nine, and I would see somebody who looked different in a supermarket, and I hate to say it now because obviously I've educated myself, but I would always kind of stare. And I'm sure a lot of kids fit that similar archetype. They, they would stare at these people that looked a little different because they were Curious. It wasn't because they were bigoted, it wasn't because they were inher inherently wrong by looking, but they were looking because they didn't see that person in their school. They didn't see that person in their town nearly as much as in other parts of the country. And it almost felt like if we didn't learn about it in school, how could it be how would it be normal? I remember at the age of twelve when gay marriage was legalized in the entire United States. And it was a big national deal, but I remember thinking to myself, that can't be right. You know, we never really talk about that in school. You know, I feel like when, you know, it's always Mother's Day and Father's Day, it's always, it's always a man and a woman in the story. It's always a couple, that romance in the story. There's never a man and a man or a woman and a woman. So how could that, how could that be right? And I remember thinking as a kid, at that age, I was like, that, then it must be wrong. We're not talking about it in school. And obviously now, I've reached the point where I'm open about who I am, and I'm open about being gay myself. So thinking about young me, not even understanding it to the point where I was like, that's wrong, that can't be right, it made me think about my kids and how I want to raise my kids to not have those thoughts about different groups of people. I want my kids to learn about all of these wonderful things that not everybody can experience because they're not, it's not a part of them culturally. But then I thought about the other kids, the other kids whose parents may have not had that thought process like I did. The parents who won't go the extra mile to let their kids educate themselves. So to prove my point a little more, I'm going to insert a few more statistics. This is a breakdown of the races of children in Putnam County. You can clearly see that over 50% are white, not Hispanic. That's obviously a lot lower number than it is for adults in Putnam County or even in Brewster, but it still shows the biggest clump is people that look the same, fit that same group. This is a national breakdown of the sexual orientation of 13 to 17 year olds in the United States as of 2019. While the majority is clearly heterosexual and cisgender, which means you identify with the gender you're born with and are only attracted to the opposite gender, these numbers rise as national acceptance rates of homosexuality increases. Because obviously in that black, there's kids who haven't accepted it themselves yet. 55% of US teenagers identify with a non caucasian ethnic group. And clearly that's more extreme in Brewster, but 55% in this country identify as something other than white. 29% of US teenagers are not members of a Christian faith. That's a variety of other religions, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Jewish, all of these different religions make up that 29%. 6.5% of teenagers are openly a member of the LGBT plus community. And I wrote, recent statistics claim more between 11% and 15% of all Americans are in the LGBT community. Because obviously it hasn't been the most open thing till today. So you're probably wondering, where am I going with this? I'm kind of just throwing numbers at you and talking. You guys are indulging me. But I thought about all of these communities, all of these people, and everything I didn't learn. All my life, I didn't know, I didn't know about all these different possibilities. The bubble of our community kind of kept them out. It cemented a certain view. It cemented a certain lifestyle into my brain, and it made younger me looking at these other communities as weird and different and wrong. So how do I expect info that's not physically in our community to enter it? Do you 
expect me to say, oh, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna move people in to, from different communities. No, that's unrealistic. So I look towards the people who have dedicated their lives to educating children, and that's teachers. Because you're probably thinking, teachers have to cover so much. How are they supposed to cover all of this information? How are they supposed to cover all of these different groups? And I say, they can't. They should focus on tolerance. Why are di different ethnicities sugarcoated in schools? Why are they not compared to, let's say, a favorite movie? Well, you know, what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite movie? It could be two different things that no, no one is right because it's a personal child's truth. So if a child says, well, my mom is from China, or my mom is from Nigeria, or my mom is from Germany, or my mom is from England. Why should any of your ethnic backgrounds be treated any differently? And that comes from learning tolerance more inherently in schools. The more we focus on tolerance, the more kids will say, that's not weird, that's just different. Tolerance brings those different thoughts and says, they are, they are okay. They are just as normal as yours are. When you see that one family lighting their menorah on Hanukkah, when everyone else has Christmas trees, that's okay, that's normal. They are doing what they learn to do just like you're doing what you learn to do. Learning about tolerance makes these new cultures and makes these new religions, makes these new sexual orientations, it makes them feel more accessible to you. And it's not like you see certain people say, oh, you're you're taking all of these cultures and you're shoving them down my kids' throat. Why shouldn't they appreciate their own culture? And to that, I'm saying, I'm not telling them to abandon their cultures and only focus on the ones they don't have. I'm proud of my culture, and I'm sure many of you in here are proud of the cultures and the traditions that your families pass down. So when I look to the future and I look to the classroom my kids will be in, I hope there's a lot more tolerance. Thank you. Thank you.